people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. In men's welterweight news, Floyd Mayweather on Jaron Boots Ennis, somebody's got to give Boots the opportunity. It's been difficult for Terrence Crawford to get the Spencery match done. It's been difficult to get the Canelo fight done. So his other option is to fight Boots Ennis. No, it isn't. I don't know how much attention Floyd Mayweather actually pays to the sport of boxing now that he's retired, but Terrence Crawford has another option, a more lucrative option, which we've talked about, an option that he seems to be pursuing. A Tim Zhu fight. Rather, the winner of Zhu versus Thurman, but most people expect that Tim Zhu's going to win that fight. He's WBO champion at 154, and Terrence Crawford is a WBO super champion, a designation that allows him to move move up in weight and be fast-tracked to a mandatory position. So where Floyd Mayweather's floating the idea that Terrence and Jaron Ennis should fight next, Terrence has other plans. And I feel like I've said all I can say about that. Where does that leave Jaron Ennis? Where indeed. Boxing insider Rick Lacier said it's amazing that Boots Ennis is being advised by none other than the weasel, Stefan Espinoza. The same guy that sunk Showtime Boxing. And now you don't have to wonder why Ennis's career is so stagnant. Now you know. That actually makes a lot of sense. I've long wondered what kind of decision-making process is Team Ennis? What are they thinking? What is it they think they stand to gain by aligning themselves with the PBC? The PBC that didn't get you a Danny Garcia fight. They seem to be struggling to get you a Mario Barrios fight or a Stanionis fight. Keith Thurman, they're feeding Keith Thurman to Tim Zhu. The idea that he's receiving counsel that he's getting advice from Stefan Espinoza. He's filling an advisory role for Jaron Boots Ennis. That explains a lot of the misdirection and the stagnant career that he's having. He doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Boxing insider Rick Glacier continued, Some of you haven't been paying attention to the big yearly drop-off of PBC boxing events. They're slowly sliding into oblivion. Example, 44 events in 2016, and every year it's been less. In 2023, just 16 shows. Projected number this year, if they limp home to the end of the year, eight events. Going out of business is a slow grind, not just a quick decision. You're telling me the PBC's only gonna do eight shows this year? Well, since having announced that Amazon Prime deal, they haven't exactly hit the ground running. No shows in January, no shows in February, almost no shows in March, save one, at the very end of the month. No news about a show in April. Rick Glacier is still forecasting doom. Rick Glacier is still forecasting disaster. And if nothing else, the PBC are definitely down from last year. They are because from January to March, they did about five shows last year from January to March. Three regular shows and two pay-per-views. They're down to one. Just one show from January into March of this year. And that kind of leadership. This is who Jaron Ennis is getting advice from. The guy who ran Showtime Boxing into the ground after 37 years in the sport. The guy who sat idly by giving Al Heyman the run of the place while he ran Showtime Boxing into the ground. This is who Jaron Ennis is receiving counsel from. At least at the moment. Said it many times here on the channel that Jaron Ennis was not yet a PBC fighter even if it appears like he wants to be, he wants to be a PBC guy, he wasn't that, not while he was on Showtime. He had an arrangement with Showtime. And a partnership with Stefan Espinoza, but that partnership has outlived its usefulness. Because the situation has changed, where it might have been convenient before to make nice, to make buddy-buddy with Stefan Espinoza, Showtime Sports President Stefan Espinoza, that wing of Showtime is gone. So what's this guy good for? What? kind of advice could you be receiving from him the truth is that team ennis might think to themselves maybe we want to align ourselves with the pbc because they have 
some of the familiar faces at or around these weights, but they don't seem to have the fight dates to accommodate you. So you're losing time. And what familiar faces we're talking about, what familiar faces we're describing, are not so invaluable that you should be losing this much time to try to gain access to them. I mean, who are we really talking about? Mario Barrios? Danny Onis? He'll be lucky if they can get him a slot on the June show because they couldn't get him one on the Zoo versus Thurman undercard. Maybe they can get him a spot on Canelo Alvarez's undercard in May or the June show, which is supposed to be the Javante Davis versus Frank Martin fight. What's that, five or six months into the year? When's the last time this guy fought? July. July of last year gonna be close to July of this one before he sees action again. And it just is what it is. At the detriment of his own schedule, at the detriment of his own career, it seems that Team Ennis is hell-bent on pairing up with the PBC. Taking advice from Stefan Espinoza. And we will see where that gets him. In men's junior middleweight news, it has been officially announced the Jack Cole K versus Bakram Mertzaliev IBF junior middleweight title fight set to go down in Germany, where Jack Colquet has been based out of for many, many years now. Bit of an underrated junior middleweight, not often talked about. But he's a vet. He's been around for a while. And he can fight a bit. The fight went to purse bid, and the people at TGB, which is just another way of saying PBC, were outbid by Aegon Sports, who represent Jack Colquet. Gonna assume that if TGB was involved, they were representing Bakram Mertzaliev, what is another sign of the PBC's loosening grip on the junior middleweight division where they used to have a stronghold between 147 and 154, having most of the familiar faces at those weights. Not anymore. Not if Jack Colquet becomes WBA champion. Jack Colquet, who has stated, is represented by Aegon Sports. Jamel Chalo is not undisputed champion anymore, and all of what were his alphabet titles have been redistributed. We know the first to go was the WBO title. That went to Tim Zhu. The IBF followed, the one we're talking about in this fight. The WBC title, that's going to be on the line in the Sebastian Fundura versus Sergei Bohachuk fight in the WBA. That's supposed to be on the line in the Madrama versus Kurbanov fight. Still don't know if that's going to go down this weekend or if it's going to be rescheduled. But the landscape at 154, it has officially changed. Oh. This fight is flying low on the radar, but irrespective of who becomes IBF champion, irrespective of who wins, there are a good number of good fights out there for them. Opportunities to unify and bring consolidation to this division. They can fight Tim Zhu for his WBO, see about unifying with him. They can fight the winner of Madrama versus Kurbanov whenever that happens, or the winner of Bohachuk versus Fundora. Who's gonna win this fight though? I am leaning a bit towards Jack Colquet to maybe win a points decision, Jack Colquet, because he's more experienced than Bakram Mertzaliev. He's won some fights, he's lost some fights, he's been around the block, been around a long time. He's only ever lost to a certain caliber of fighter. Yeah, guys like Sergei Didivyanchenko, Dimitrius Andre, Masiej Sulietsky, whereas Bakram Mertzaliev, Bakram hasn't proven himself to be that level of fighter. A fighter, an unbeaten fighter, that's been flying largely under the radar for many years now, fighting in the non-televised portions of PBC shows, taking step-aside deal after step-aside deal after step-aside deal since 2019. When he beat Jorge Fortea to become the IBF's mandatory challenger. That's why you can't really pity him. You can't feel but so sorry for him. If you keep accepting all these step-aside deals, you're only delaying your own opportunity, and that's what he's been doing. He's been the IBF's mandatory challenger longer than Jermel Charlo was IBF champion. But he's a largely unproven fighter. Unbeaten, but also unproven. Saving grace for him is that he is a little taller than Jack Colquet and a little longer, certainly younger, several years younger than Jack. Jack Colquet's 38, whereas Bakram Mertzaliev, he's 31, seven years younger. But Jack Colquet's got home field advantage, and that matters. That matters quite a bit because in the event that the rounds are close and it's hard to separate these guys, who do you think they're going to swing those rounds to? That Bakram Mertzaliev in Germany, he might need a knockout to avoid any funny business. Bakram Mertzaliev, who was last in action in December of last year, that's the only fight that he had last year. He only fought once. The same can be said for Jack Colquet. Jack was last in action in July of last year, and he only fought once. Neither guy's been all that busy in the last 12 months, but 
Jack's got more experience, and if nothing else, Jack has home field advantage. Shorter, stumpier fighter with the lower center of gravity, and he's crafty. He can be. I'm leaning towards him to win this fight on that premise because I'm not sure that Bakram Murtazaliev can take it out of the judge's hands. He's got an unblemished record of 21 wins with no losses, no draws, and 15 knockouts. The way that breaks down is he's got a 71% knockout percentage, but at what level? Against who? Who's he been knocking out? There is a legitimate argument that this is a step up in class for Bakram Murtazaliev, that thus far, this will be the best fighter that he's fought so far. And I don't think the people at Aegon Sports who represent Jack Colke went as far as winning the purse bid to give Bakram Murtazaliev a fair shake. Ultimately, I'm leaning towards Jack. Veteran of the sport. Might become WBA champion very soon. In April. Upstairs in men's super middleweight news, caught in the boxing voice, David Benavidez tells me he's targeting Gilberto Ramirez if he beats Arsen Gulamarian later on this month for the WBA. He's ready to fight Zerto in an all-Mexican fight immediately after his June fight with Oleksandr Vojtik. What's your thoughts on this? Check out the full interview available for our members for early access. Shout out to the boxing voice. I don't think David Benavidez can make 168 anymore. Nope. Those of you that have been following this channel the last few weeks, last few months, will have heard me say that more than once. once I once, think that once. making that weight will leave him so depleted, so drained, he can't do it anymore. And for all of this hullabaloo about a Canelo Alvarez fight, I'm telling you, he can't get down that low anymore. I don't think he can, and that's likely why Al Heyman never offered Canelo David Benavidez. Remember, he wasn't part of the original three-fight deal. And when they tried to make amendments to the original deal, David still wasn't supposed to be Canelo Alvarez's next fight, the latest. Yeah, he wants him to fight Jaime Munguia. Now that Canelo Alvarez is reportedly back over there is that they want him to fight Jaime Munguia, then Jermall Charlo in September, not David Benavidez, which we've talked about to no end. But if he can't make the weight anymore, then why is Jose Benavidez and David Benavidez and their promoter, Samson Lukowicz, why have they been carrying on the way they've been carrying on? Marketing strategy, a marketing angle. They want to shift the blame over to Canelo Alvarez when the fight doesn't happen, when the fight was never actually offered. It's a marketing strategy. It's all spin. I don't think David can get down to 168 anymore. If he does go up in June, I don't think he's coming back down. But they need an angle. They still need an angle to sell him and sell his fights because 175 really isn't as talked about as 168. They still want to keep his name attached to Canelo Alvarez, even though they know he's not coming back down. That fight might be dead. For all the talk you've seen about it, the last week or so, the last month or so, how long that's been going on that fight might be dead david is talking about going up the cruiserweight why would he be talking about going up the cruiserweight after the vajdik fight we've talked this thing to death and it looks to me like this is a guy who cannot get down to 168 anymore he knows he can't and he's been struggling to do it for a while you will remember that early last year samson lukowick said that they signed a contract to fight david morell later on in the year but later on in the year they didn't fight David Morrell. They fought Demetrius Andre. If you're a guy that's struggling to make the weight, you don't want to go in there with a puncher. You don't want to go in there with a big puncher, and that's what David Morrell is. He's a big puncher, whereas Demetrius, comparatively, he's smaller, he's older, he's never been known for power. They didn't land on that guy by accident. It was by design, because this whole time, they know, they've known. David Benavidez has been struggling to get down to 168, and that's what a puncher will reveal. That's what a puncher will bring out, that you're not going to take the shots as well. You're not going to absorb them as well. Not from him. So when I see that David plans on moving up the light heavyweight in his next fight, and he's talking about going up to cruiserweight right after that, that's what it communicates to me, that this whole time, you knew you couldn't make it back down to 168. You knew the whole time, but that didn't stop you from talking down Canelo. Even though you knew you weren't coming back down. You, your father, your promoter. Shice the tactics. David Benavidez has been at super middleweight for as long as I can remember. And for a guy that size, I've been telling you over and over, it couldn't have gotten easier over time now he's busting at the seams it's like what michaela mayer said when she said she moved up from 130 up to 135 her body just kind of exploded afterwards because she had stayed at 130 for too long i think that's what's going on 
with David. Well, he's fighting Vojtik next. If he makes it past him, that lines him up for the winner of Better Beef versus Bivol, though, because he's talking about fighting Zerd over Ramirez after that. What do those three guys have in common? What, Dimitri Bivol, Artur Better Beef, and Zerd over Ramirez? Yeah, what do those three guys have in common? Uh, I don't know. None of them are PBC fighters. Not a single one of them. Dimitri Bivol, he's with Matchroom. Artur, he's with Top Rank. Zerdo, he's with Golden Boy. Not a single one of these guys that... David Benavidez is lining himself up for or talking about. Not a single one of those guys are on his side of the street. And it's curious because he said he wouldn't be willing to cross over to the zone for a Canelo Alvarez fight. So how do you plan on fighting them? You know, when that news broke a couple of days ago that Canelo might be leaving the PBC and going back to the zone, David was asked if he would cross over to fight him. And in so many words, he said no. So how does he plan on fighting them? That's the question. The idea in moving up to light heavyweight and taking on Oleksandr Vojdyk is to become WBC interim champion, which would line him up for the winner of Better Beef versus Bivol. But it sounds like he doesn't even plan on sticking around after that. Then what's the point? Keep busy fight, I guess, because actually getting the winner of Better Beef versus Bivol, either one of those fights could prove difficult to negotiate because Artur's with top rank and Dimitri is with Matchroom. And I don't think either of those promotional outfits are going to truck off their undisputed champion over to Amazon Prime for a mandatory challenger. Go ahead. Pressure the WBC to order the fight. Say you do. Do you even have the money to bring any one of those fighters, any one of those guys to your side of the street? And if you don't, and a purse bid ensues. Do you have the money to win the purse bid? That's the question. David Benavidez's fight with Oleksandr Vozdyk is set to go down in June, the same month as the undisputed light heavyweight title fight. Though it doesn't sound like he plans on staying there. And maybe that's why. He's talking about Zerto Ramirez, former WBO super middleweight champion Zerto Ramirez, who reigned as a champion alongside him, parallel to him, several years ago, but they never fought. David was and still is with the PBC, whereas in those days, Zerto was with top rank. Now, he's with Golden Boy. He tried his hand at light heavyweight for a couple of fights, but it didn't work out. He suffered his first professional loss to Dimitri Bivol, subsequently moved up in weight, and at the end of this month, he's gonna try to become the first Mexican-born cruiserweight champion. David Benavidez wants him. If he accomplishes that. Does he get him? It's the question. I don't think Asuka De La Hoya is just going to truck off his cruiserweight champion to David's side of the street. It's a good fight. Irrespective of David Benavidez's polarization the last few weeks, the last few months, and all the Canelo stuff, irrespective of any of that, this is a good fight. Yeah. And so is the Vozdik fight. This is a moneymaker. David Benavidez, the Arizonian dubbed the... <laughs> quote unquote Mexican monster versus the actual Mexican, the Mexican national, Zerto Ramirez. You can sell it. It's one of those fights to where neither guy has all that much marquee value, but if you put them together, you have a decent sized show. You have a decent sized fight that people would turn up for. Yeah, but David's still playing sides of the street. If you weren't willing to go to the zone for Canelo, why would you be willing to go there for Zerto? That's a smaller fight. Compared to a Canelo fight it is. So there is that to be reconciled.